When I turned 18, something big happened on my birthday. Every comfort that I knew, gone. This is what it feels like to age out of the foster care system in America. And this is the feeling that nearly 30,000 young people experience. Can be better. You and me, working together for success beyond 18. Improve the lives of young people aging out of foster care. Learn more at jimcaseyyouth.org. Good afternoon. Um, I generally say that because uh, for me, I, I generally find this is the time of day where I have a hard time focusing, not actually in the morning. But uh, um, uh, so I, I wanted to start by saying uh, I'm going to, uh, I'm the moderator, but I'm also supposed to make some comments about uh, homeless young adults, which I will. Um, but um, I wanted to start by commenting on um, all the references that have been made over the last uh, couple of days, particularly today, around the forgotten half, the other half, et cetera. Um, because we're now moving into, we've been kind of progressively moving into part of the program where I think the focus is really on that. Certainly the next session on folks in, in the criminal justice system uh, will be speaking largely to that population. Um, uh, can you, next slide, or, oh, I can do it, yeah, here we go. Very good. Uh, so what I want to do is, is make a few comments around uh, what, what I would call vulnerable populations. We've talked about some of them. What makes them vulnerable is a little tricky. Sometimes they're defined more by the systems that are involved in the, than their vulnerability. But I think from this point onward, uh, we could describe all the populations we're talking about using that term. Um, I think the context for that, that the concern with that population is what we've been talking about, the demographic changes, maybe, we don't know, uh, changes in identity, uh, human development, psychological development, et cetera, during the transition of adulthood for the general population. A lot of the observations about that population may or may not apply to a lot of young people in this country. Just a simple statistic, I was fascinated by the, the stuff on uh, social media, um, but curious about uh, research based on uh, phone calls. Uh, because we know that around 4% of the population country doesn't have a phone, if, and that's probably a lot higher percentage for very low-income people. So access to very low-income young people to some of the things we've been talking about is, is, is less clear. Um, we do have a variety of public systems established to assist particular populations. We're going to talk about three of them, or three sets of them today, uh, young adults formerly in foster care. Uh, by definition, they're defined by their involvement in the system, and literally a lot of the benefits that Gina Samuel is going to talk about, you're not eligible for unless you were in care on your 18th birthday. So not only do you have to be in the system, you have to be there right at that point where you make the transition. Uh, homeless young adults um, and uh, young adults receiving need-based public benefits, uh, TANF, SNAP, et cetera, uh, and, and there we'll get, I'm sure that uh, Elizabeth Lauer Bosch will get to, Bash <laughs> will get to um, uh, young parents, one thing we haven't talked a lot about, that there's a lot of young parents and a lot of them are, are not doing so well. So there's some shared themes across uh, these, these uh, vulnerable groups. Uh, many of them have limited abilities, difficulty acquiring skills, uh, some of the special groups we've already talked about, unreliable or non-existent family support. Uh, the state became the parent of young people in foster care, runaway homeless youth. Uh, that's a common theme there for, for obvious reasons. Um, Tasks of the transition can seem very daunting and be very daunting for a, a lot of young people with disabilities, mental health problems, and things we've talked about. And in some cases, the very systems that we've set up to help young people might actually, uh, at least in some cases, have contributed to the problems they'd face during young adulthood. Um, another reason to focus on vulnerable populations is that in many cases that they respond to the systems we have, uh, respond to needs that were recognized during childhood and adolescence. Um, and these young people have depended on public systems for assistance and services. Low-income children in low-income single-parent families to rely on systems, uh, Medicaid, uh, TANF, et cetera, food stamps, and yet their eligibility can an end for that support or become very limited the minute they reach the age of 18. Um, and so in some cases that's abrupt, in some cases it, it phases out over time. Um, and so with that, I'm going to go on to uh, just some shared themes that people have been talking about. So I can quickly run through these. Uh, uh, young people with these challenges, uh, on average, experience poor early adult outcomes. Some groups, particularly the poor and racial and ethnic minorities, are overrepresented in all of these populations. Uh, that being said, the populations are not homogeneous. And so looking at heterogeneity is very important uh, from a social scientific standpoint, but certainly from a public policy standpoint. 
And there's considerable overlap between these populations. This has come up over and over again. Frankly, one of the reasons I'm very interested in, in studying youth aging out of foster care is not just because I worked with them 25 years ago, but because just about any challenge that we've been talking about here over the last couple of days, they've got it in spades. You know, half of them, half the young men will spend some time in jail between 18 and 21. About one out of six are eligible for SSI, 40% more special education. And you could talk, you could go to the criminal justice system and you'll find very similar overlap. Uh, between uh, young people in that system and a lot of these other systems and needs. And then a lot of the factors that promote successful transitions to adulthood that have been talked about already actually apply to the extent that we have researched apply for these groups. So what about homeless young adults? Um, a group that I was asked to talk about that I, I know something about, but I'm certainly not an expert. Um, I would refer you to the work of people like Paul Torho and, and uh, Dennis Culhane, for example. Uh, just in terms of how many there are, very limited and in, in many cases very dated information is what we have available uh, on just the magnitude of this population. Uh, if you're talking about minors up to the age of 18, uh, the, the statistics that generally get thrown out there come from something called NISMARC, National Instance Studies of Missing, Abducted, Runaway, and Throwaway Children. Um, this comes from surveys of parents, young people themselves, service providers, and law enforcement officials. And according to NISMART, about 1.7 million children, this is way back in, in uh, you know, 13 years ago, um, uh, spent at least one night homeless. Uh, but over 99% of those minors go home. Um, approximately 380,000 remain away for a week, and 131,000 remain gone for a month. So when we talk about homelessness, folks who study it, well, we have systems that respond to it. In many ways, it's, it's a symptom. It's an outcome of a lot of constellation of challenges, and for most young people become homeless, it happens for a short period of time and that's it. Um, in terms of young adults, um, the, you know, I don't know that it's great data, the, the, again, the statistic that's thrown out there comes from uh, service systems, the Homeless Management Information System, uh, which is the HUD's system for tracking information uh, on people served by HUD-funded programs. And according to that source of data, about 150,000 young people between 18 and 24 are served each year. Uh, with the vast majority characterized uh, using Dennis Colhane's uh, typology as, as transitional, sort of they are homeless for a very short period of time once, and that's likely it. Uh, but 13,000 experiencing episodic homelessness, uh, and then 15,000 chronic homelessness. They're, they're, they're homeless for a long period of time. What are their characteristics? This comes from a variety of studies. Again, we need a lot more research in this population, although I would argue in some ways population-based studies of the other half of very low-income populations are going to teach us more than going and studying shelter populations. Um, uh, but what we, we do know some things that, that, that are fairly consistent across studies. Strained or non-existent relations with family. Um, so high self-reported rates of parental maltreatment. Sometimes we're able to link administrative data. We find the same thing. Uh, disproportionate history of foster care placement, juvenile justice system involvement, and adult just, justice system involvement. Talk to people in the adult justice system, how many of you have been homeless. Uh, unstable family living arrangements, uh, poor educational attainments, work experience, limited, in some cases very, very limited, in many cases uh, human capital. Frequent engagement in risky behavior uh, during homeless episodes, um, and frequent victimization during homeless episodes, physical and sexual victimization. Many are parents, which is something that we don't often think about, although folks who provide services for you know, homeless people know that well. Um, households headed by a young adult under the age of 25 make up more than 25% of homeless families sheltered within the homelessness assistance system in this country. Um, very briefly, U.S. policy on homeless young adults. We could talk about lots of things. I mean, I would argue some of the things that Elizabeth's going to talk about are policy you know, to prevent homelessness among young adults. Uh, but the, the one law we have that focuses specifically on this population is the Runaway and Homeless Youth Act. Um, and it's a, a, in, in this year, it's a, because of sequestration, $109 million, $115 million has been fairly flat for a while. Uh, and it consists of uh, three programs, a street outreach program, which sends workers in the community to connect youth with services, a basic center program with funds drop-in centers uh, for shelter up to 21 days, and a, a variety of other services and then a transitional living program which um, houses young people between 16 and 21. So I want to point out here that this doesn't go all the way, doesn't go well into uh, early adulthood at all, these, these programs, uh, for up to 18 months with employment, education, mental health, and other services. 
Uh, very little research comparing the effectiveness of these interventions, um, and even less research on the comparative effectiveness for various subpopulations, so homeless young people with significant mental health problems or homeless young people who are parents, for example, really no comparative work. Um, I was asked, our, our mission there says, comment on the adequacy of these programs. Uh, well, given the magnitude of the problem the number of people serve, there's a clear mismatch between uh, the resources provided uh, around homelessness for this population and uh, the need. Um, so there are other programs, the FUP program, et cetera, but uh, they're very, they, they are dwarfed by the Runaway and Homeless Youth Program, which is inadequate to the need. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to um, my colleague, Gina Samuels, at the University of Chicago, to talk about uh, foster youth in transition.